The Yamaha DX7 is one of the most iconic and best-selling synthesizers of all times, and the instrument that defined the sound of the 80s. In the wake of the recent analog revival, FM synthesis and the DX7 have also found their way back to the spotlight, and manufacturers even began reissuing FM-compatible instruments. I believe that, even after more than 30 years have passed since its release, the Yamaha DX7 still offers a lot to be discovered and explored. Let's rediscover the Yamaha DX7. The Yamaha DX7 is notorious for its complex sound shaping possibilities and hence the difficulty of creating new sounds. Many musicians therefore relied heavily on the preset voices supplied with the instrument on these ROM cartridges that you could stick into the cartridge slot on the front panel. If you did want to create your own original voices, the DX7 offered 32 slots of user voice memory, which even for the time was rather few. For example, the analog Juno 60 by Roland which was released a year earlier, offered almost twice as many slots. Of course, a single voice on the DX7 consisted of more than 150 parameter values and required much more memory than an analog patch on the Juno. But that fact offered little consolation to a voice creator. To mitigate the scarcity of internal voice memory slots, Yamaha offered as an option dedicated user voice or RAM cartridges that allowed storing onto them an additional bank of 32 voices. Even back in the day those cartridges were quite expensive, but nowadays they are exceedingly hard to find and usually sell at collector's prices. Fortunately the electronic circuit of these cartridges is really simple. Indeed, the cartridge slot is basically a tap into the synthesizer's internal data address and control buses, and the actual cartridge simply contains an external memory chip. So in theory, it should be easy to build a RAM cartridge for oneself. And that's exactly what I did. I started by studying the schematics in the DX7 service manual, and also similar projects I found on the intertubes. Then I designed the schematics in KiCad. I had to design my own edge connector, but there's a nice web tool that does the heavy lifting for you. Then I designed a PCB, and after several unsuccessful attempts, I finally sent it off to a PCB factory, and a few weeks later received a stack of PCBs. So here's the result. My very own RAM cartridge in a cardboard case. Yes, you heard right. Cardboard. You guys out there all have 3D printers, but I'm quite content using cardboard. Um, this cartridge is full, so let's build another one. The PCB accepts 64K and 256K EEPROM chips, because they have the same pinout. So you can store either two banks of voices if you mount the 64K chip and the switch, or 8 of them if you mount a 256k chip and an 8 position encoding switch. Well you could if I had designed the PCB correctly, but I didn't, so we'll do another 2 bank cartridge. In order for the PCB to sit nicely in the cardboard case, I'd like the back of the PCB to be as flat as possible, with no pins poking through. So I decided to cut the leads and IC pins before soldering them in place and then just flood the hole with solder. Ready? Okily dokily.
There's a few issues with the cartridge that need resolving. The connection isn't always super reliable. Sometimes you need to wiggle the cartridge a little. So I'm in the process of redesigning the PCB. I think the edge connector pins should be narrower to leave room for the plastic separators between the connector pins to slide in. Also, I would like to use surface mount versions of the ICs on the board, because they are cheaper. And finally, I would like to add a few LED indicators, because blinking lights. But that's for another video. In the meantime, as always, thanks for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more music and blinking lights. Tschüss zusammen.